everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Spirit of Success. I'm your host, Yara, and on today's episode, we have the pleasure of speaking with Mr. Shaheen Sopani, an entrepreneur, businessman, and executive. Founder and previous president of the digital learning company Swiss VBS and current vice president for digital learning at BTS, which bought his former company, as well as a director of the Soleiman Bergis Foundation, Mr. Sopani continues to show his passion for service in the work he does. Welcome, Mr. Sopani. How are you today? Very good. Thank you, Yara. Great to see you. Thank you. It's great seeing you as always, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. So on today's episode, we will be discussing careers related to entrepreneurship and business. But before we get into that, we want to know what got you interested in entrepreneurship and business, and how did you get your start? Great question. Uh, accident. <laughs> I, I, like many um, youth, were trying to figure out what I was going to do in life. So I actually got my degree, uh, my bachelor's degree in chemistry, because I thought that's what I was going to pursue and I was going to go to medical school. Um, And so the first advice I would give to all young people is if you know what you want to do already, great, go after it, don't look back. But if you don't know what you're going to do, also great, and don't worry about it. And I highly suggest that you try to get as much experience uh, about life and that will um, lead the way. And so first year of college, uh, one thing I should have done, I didn't, I, I'm teaching you, is take every course possible, even stuff you would never dream of, to open your minds of, of what's out there in the world. And the second suggestion I would make is um, try to do of some service, you know, uh, there's a concept, a year of service, there's the Peace Corps, do some service before you start college, if you can, because that will open up your minds as well of what you want to do, and where you want to be. So I think trying to do that, before you get involved in college, and then the workforce, and then building up a family, and then retiring, you'll never have time to do it again. Didn't answer your question. How did I get into entrepreneurship? But uh, <laughs> I guess wonderful advice. <laughs> I went right for the advice. Yeah, I I think entrepreneurship. The way, like I said, it, it was an accident when I when I went and did chemistry. Then I was getting my master's degree in biochemistry, and it was my father who saw that I didn't seem very happy, and he told me that. Um, you know, you should, you should try different things and, and don't put so much pressure on yourself to become a doctor, as they said. And uh, so I did. Uh, I tried different things. And my first business that I started was a real estate business. I became a, uh, uh, a partner in a real estate business with a very good friend of mine. And we started it and it was very successful. Uh, and then I I started really getting into investing and business and so forth. I was very excited about it. And as I was doing that and learning from that, uh, I eventually moved to Switzerland and I started a business there and I had it for about 18 years before uh, I sold it. The reason I like entrepreneurship is I never get bored. You're always learning something new about different businesses on how things are done. And that's, that's what made me tick. And I'm going to comfortably tell you that I would have been the worst doctor on the planet Earth. So I'm glad I didn't go that route. I highly doubt it because you are someone who is very driven and focused on whatever they do. But you definitely are somebody who's also very creative, um, as we have seen through the different projects that you do. So I think this is a good fit for you, like you said. Mm -hmm. Um, How has your career and entrepreneurial interests evolved over time? Yeah, so I think... One thing, uh, especially with entrepreneurship, is you you got to be willing to suspend disbelief. People will tell you, you can't do that. People will tell you, oh, my God, hundreds of people have started that. People will tell you, are, is, that, is that really what you want to do? I mean, these are all negative statements. And I think the one thing I loved about entrepreneurship, it's, it's on your shoulders. It's, on you, it's in your hands. And you have to take it and and go for it now some people love that i do uh some people love the structure so 
you got to figure out what you are comfortable with because entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur has a lot of unknowns, a tremendous amount of unknowns. So you got to have a lot of faith and be willing to roll up your sleeves and figure things out. Um, be more of a solution thinking in a solution way. Um, so as, as I started businesses and sold them and, and did things like that, I, I really learned um, how to have a tough skin. I also learned how to solve problems quickly. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's a great lesson to have uh, in life to be able to do that kind of thing, right? Uh, but I, I have a soft heart for entrepreneurs because I know what they go through to become success. And I think that, you know, all my businesses weren't successful, for sure not. Um, some we closed down, uh, you know, before I started this main business, but that's okay. I had a uh, aviation company where we were teaching people how to learn fly, to learn how to fly uh, Cessna airplanes. That business broke even before we finally got rid of it. By the way, we got rid of it in 1999. But anyway, uh, so it's the idea of, of, of learning and continuously staying on your feet. Yeah. And I think it's something that you can combine in other jobs too. Like, you know, I think entrepreneurship on its own is that creative field. And it's something that people can take with them into other careers um, and have that same spirit. So it's, it's quite an amazing um, career and being able to do that and be successful in it, it is also another step to it. And so with that, how do you define success and how has this definition evolved both in your career and in your life? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, the world defines success of how much money you got in the bank and how much possessions you have and assets you have and all those things. I definitely don't define it that way. Those are the outcomes of the success uh, in a business. That's fine. I think when you define success of creating unity in your family, when you define success of making sure the people that work with you are happy and want to come to work and are united, um, I think for me, success is being of service through your business to other people. So if you can, if you can, whatever you're doing, if you are serving uh, and, and doing that service in the spirit of, of like worshiping, uh, then I consider that success. And I really think it's funny. I, I think when, when you do that, the other stuff that the world thinks is important comes with it. <laughs> You know, who doesn't want to work with an honest whatever, name the profession, right? Yeah. Who doesn't want to work with someone that wants to unify uh, and have unity with you? Who doesn't want to work with someone that feels like, hey, this person is really servicing me with love and kindness and respect. So I think, you know, when you follow those principles, the success that comes with it becomes automatic. And, and I think, unfortunately, the world focuses too much on Excel sheets and what's the bottom line and has your stock gone up and what's your ROI return on investment and all this stuff, which are important. Don't get me wrong. They are important because th those are criteria to see how your business is going, but they don't focus enough on the human interaction and the service you provide. I think that point of when you are doing things in a manner where your focus is on being honest, being united, serving, and um, doing things in an ethical manner, everything else comes with it, as you said. And um, so obviously, you know, as you've spoken about it up till now, service is a very big part of your business and the projects that you um, are a part of. But can you speak with us a little bit more um, specifically about how you've incorporated service in your career and how you think entrepreneurship is a great venue for being able to serve? Yeah, well, Entrepreneurship gives you the freedom. You have to make a decision on what you're going to spend your time and money and effort to. While when you're working for someone or, or an environment, uh, you know, you could still do those things, but you know, you're, you're committed from nine to five. I will tell you entrepreneurship, that's not the way it is. You're committed from it's 24 seven sometimes, especially when you're getting started. So that's the, you know, it's, it's give and take. It's, it's not as, you know, when you see people that have been entrepreneurs and are hyper successful, trust me, they've had a long road to get to where they did. So you gotta, you gotta uh, think that through. But I think one element, no matter if you're an entrepreneur or working for a company or you're a lawyer or whatever, 
if you can create an element of service, both with how you do things with the people, but also think about how you can, you know, make an impact in society through your service um, is really important. It reminds me of a story of uh, Bill Gates. He was still in the garage, the founder of Microsoft. He was still in the garage working away um, with just one or two friends. And finally they got their first contract and it was a sizable contract enough that they can come out of the garage and actually rent an office. And of course that's an exciting time for an entrepreneur that you got a contract to do that. You know, this company's worth billions of dollars now. So back then, you know, they, they must've been very excited. And the story is that his, uh, his mother came to him while he's still sitting in the garage, they're starting to pack up to move to their new office. And his mother says, son, you know, there's this, uh, you know, I work for this charity and we need some funds to help with this charity. And he turned to his mom and said, mom, I haven't even left the garage. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Barely have anything. Uh, she goes, but I heard you got a new contract. And he said, yes, but that I need that to build the business. And she said to him, if you don't learn how to give back now, you'll never learn. And he did. He wrote a check, whatever it was. It didn't matter. And he's been writing checks ever since, <laughs> you know, with the Bill and Melinda uh, Foundation and, and the great work they do uh, around the world. Um, so I, I think it's something that you learn and it becomes ingrained in you that, that you have to do. You have to give back. Uh, and when you do, you're actually benefiting. <laughs> That's the thing, you know, the, the, I love the word sacrifice. We should really look at it. The word sacrifice, the first indication is you're giving up something and hence the word sacrifice. But you know, the word sacred comes from sacrifice. So by sacrificing, you're making something sacred. You're making your action sacred. And sacred is of course, uh, an ultimate thing you want to be able to do in life. So yeah, he might have he might have sacrificed and couldn't probably get another chair he needed in the office, but he doesn't have to worry about chairs anymore. <laughs> With all this wonderful insight and advice, um, I kind of wanted to ask more of an experience question um, just about one of the projects that I'd known you've done that maybe necessarily isn't enclosed in the box of entrepreneurship and business. Um, but a few years ago, you had worked on a movie called Infidel with Omid oh, Dejaniki. We'd love to know more about like, what was the experience of doing that? What got you into even um, looking to do something like film if it was like, you know, outside of your, of your field? Right. So Omid and I are great friends. I love the guy. And um, one thing we've decided as, you know, we're the same age practically is that as we get older, we have to find ways to be more impactful with, with what we do. That project was many, many years ago. And he had this idea of this film and the writer that wrote it with him is a good friend as well, um, to create a storyline. And if you haven't seen the movie, it's worth it. Uh, of He plays a, a Muslim character that finds out he's been adopted. So he finds a way to get his adoption papers to see, you know, to try to find his own family. And as he does, he finds out that he's actually Jewish. <laughs> so here's a hardcore Muslim that now finds out he's Jewish. So his whole identity and life turns upside down. And what does it all mean? So, I mean, it's a, it's a great film to make you think of how we pigeonhole people of who they are, right? And why do we do that? You know, it, it, one of the things I believe is that, uh, it, well, you know, when you look at science, for example, uh, science is science. I mean, if I said to you right now, uh, you know, biology should be taken out of science. I think biology is useless. You would say, I'm crazy. You can't take biology out of science. It's part of the ecosystem of science. Or if I said to you, for example, uh, American science is better than German science. 
what? <laughs> you know, American chemistry is better than German chemistry. You would say that's crazy as well because it's part of one ecosystem. So one of the writings I love about the Baha'i faith, it's in a document called One Common Faith, which is one of the important principles of the Baha'i faith that all these great faiths come from the same source, which is one God, and they all have contributed to our spiritual heritage. There's a quote in that document that says, religion is religion as science is science, which means that religion is also part of one ecosystem. But we haven't allowed ourselves to do that. We've put them in as Jewish, Muslim, Baha'i, Zoroastrian, Buddhist, and we've divided ourselves that way. While chemists and biologists and physicists don't do that because <laughs> they're one ecosystem. The more, quick, the more as quickly we realize that religion is one ecosystem, we will have a very different world than we have today. Why did I tell you that whole story? That's why I love the infidel. The whole point of how hilarious and crazy it is uh, in the storyline of a Muslim who finds out he's Jewish and does it matter? <laughs> and the answer is no, of course. Um, and that's the film. And that's why I love that film. And that's why I was the associate producer and, and um, wanted to be involved with Omid uh, to make it. That is amazing. And it sounds like a hilarious movie. I was watching a few clips of it. Um, the other day and it's super funny so definitely check it out if you haven't yet um, and and it carries such an important message along with being funny so um, we're going to shift into talking a little bit about youth and um, our first question about that is what do you think is the role of youth in today's society hmm. great question I wish I was as mature as you to answer it <laughs> back then <laughs> um, you know, as a young person, I was very, very fortunate. And, and the reason for that is I had wonderful parents. I had a wonderful sister. I, my sister is still here, of course. My parents have passed away. But I had a wonderful extended family. And I had a wonderful Baha'i community. And, and I felt um, not only safe, but I, I, I felt heard. I felt... Um, like I was part of a vibrant community. Um, and I think one of the things that youth have to remember is that you have a voice and it's a very important voice. And if you're in a situation where that voice is not allowed to be shared, change the situation if you can, right? Because your voice is too important not to be heard. Um, the greatest inventions, the greatest developments, we're all started by youth, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and so I think the, the role of youth uh, and what they can do, you know, we have in the Baha'i writings that youth can move the world. I totally believe in that. Um, and I think, you know, the impact that the youth can have. And at the end of the day, this is your world and don't let us old people <laughs> mess it up for you. Don't get me wrong, there's some great old people too. I think that's another thing. If I have to give advice, the one lucky thing I've had my entire life is I seeked people that were older than me to learn from them, right? Uh, wise people, and I can, you know, there's tons of them. Professor Sohail Bushri was one of my mentors. Dr. Hossein Danish was another mentor. Douglas Martin was another mentor. These are individuals that I seeked to find and get advice from. Uh, they weren't perfect human beings, of course they weren't, but they had life experience that gave me a lot of richness and, and allowed me to make my own decisions based on that experience. So seek out those people and, and uh, get that wisdom, but make sure you never lose your voice and your own identity of who you are. Because one thing is guaranteed, you're gonna get old like the rest of us. <laughs> So take advantage of that youthfulness that you have and gain as much knowledge as you can. It'll make your life a lot, I think, better. I love that advice. And it's a very empowering um, to youth. So, you know, we are always told that we have a voice and that it needs to be heard. And, and like you said, 
eventually this is going to be our world but at the same time I think combining that with learning from people before us um, and talking with our elders and, and people who have had experience combining those two together makes youth unstoppable um, and with that, what advice do you have specifically for youth who would like to pursue a career in business and or entrepreneurship? Yeah. So I'm going to, the first one is a warning. It's hard work. <laughs> you know, uh, like I said earlier in, in your program, you know, it's uh, because it's, it, it's, it has to do with unknowns, right? And the first thing you got to figure out, people will say, hey, that's a great idea. You should make a business out of it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it is a great idea, but what does that mean? And what does it take? And so forth. And all the negative things people will tell you. So before you get into what I would say entrepreneurship, uh, working with other people in a business is, is another thing, but you know, actually starting something on your own, you have to see where your characteristic is and where your tolerance is for the unknown. Are you a person that could handle the unknown, right? You're about to start a business for a, building a product that you hope people will buy. Just using that as an example. Product isn't built, it's just an idea. And you gotta go find a production company. How do you market it? Who do you hire to build it? Uh, how do you sell it? Uh, and, and it just, you know, what's the legal advice? You could see it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it seems almost insurmountable. It's not. But are you willing to accept the unknown? And if you are, then you're going to be just fine. Um, and, and, you know, I have to say, faith is like that too. Yeah. <laughs> right? So faith means you're willing to suspend disbelief until you try to figure out and understand. And at the end, you still might not understand. If I tell you, tell me what God is exactly, no one can answer that question, but you have faith that God exists. Yeah. As my writing says, it's the unknowable essence. So this element of faith, um, I think is actually extremely important in, in entrepreneurship. So if you've practiced it, within a religious context, you'll, you'll be, you'll be fine in the entrepreneurship. That is wonderful advice. And thank you so much for your insight today. It's been wonderful speaking with you. And before we end our segment, is there any additional words of advice or encouragement for our audience? Yeah, I think, you know, the last thing I'd say, and I think it's important is um, surround yourself with great people, you know, um, old, young, uh, you know, I mentioned about, especially the people that are wise around you, solicit their advice, take it to heart and make your own decisions. Uh, but never, ever forget that, you know, there's greater forces than what we see on the earth. <laughs> yeah. And you got to tap into it and, and, and uh, figure out what it means. And if you don't understand something and something is unknown, if you have surrounded yourself with great people, they'll help you out, right? And it's people that love you and believe in you. So don't don't ever, ever think. And I'll the last thing I'll say is an advice that my grandmother told my mother and my mother told me, whatever situation you're in today uh, and it's bad and it doesn't look good, just remember that there's someone much worse off than you right at that moment and get up and go serve anyone you can. And through that service, you will pull yourself out of whatever the mess you're in. So don't ever give up and allow service to guide you. That is beautiful. And that is something I think we will all be carrying away with us from this episode and a bunch more. So thank you once again, Mr. Sobhani. It was wonderful speaking with you today. And we learned a lot both about your career and um, took away from the amazing advice you had to give. Mr. Sopani has also been working on a project covering the travels of Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah in North America in a website called 239 Days. Um, this will be premiering soon um, of the old version that's being updated. 
And he is also working on a show with comedian Omid Dejalili titled Minority Report. Would you like to share more about these projects with us? Yeah, sure. 239 Days we did in 2012 because Abdul Baha, the son of the Prophet, founder of the Baha'i Faith, came for 239 days and traveled uh, North America, the US and Canada. And, uh, you know, we predict that he spoke to over 100,000 people. That's without Instagram or Twitter. So, and, and that was an incredible time. And he was way beyond his time. And what he was talking about, of course, directly from his father's message for the day of, of unity. Um, so we decided to follow him exactly 100 years later in 2012. And we redid his speeches and the places he went and the people he talked to and the subjects he was talking about from elections to women suffrage to race and the issue of race. For example, he said racism is the most challenging issue in the United States and that was 1912. Um, so it's, it's a great inspirational um, story. And so you could literally read each story there about five or six minutes a day and hopefully get inspired. Right now, the site, we're updating it because we're adding new things. Uh, so it's it's down right now, it's under update, but within a, within a month or so, it, it'll be back up and it'll be searchable and so forth. So we're very excited about that. The other show is with, again, my good friend, Omi Jalili. He had an idea of a, of a talk show where he wanted to talk about uh, serious topics with a little bit element of humor. So he, he, um, we started this concept, it's called Minority Report, and uh, I'm, I'm a producer there, so I'm, I'm just helping them, helping him to hopefully get it off the ground. And the whole idea is he's gonna interview very, very well-known people, and they're uh, gonna have really deep discussions of the issues of the day, um, and especially when it comes to race, uh, when it comes to being a minority, what does that really mean? Um, so it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be a show that'll make you think and hopefully have some fun. So the, the first show we already did was with Rain Wilson, uh, from the office and, um, it went very well and it was, uh, it, it was a really great first, uh, pilot show. So once, uh, that's done, we're hoping by 2021, they'll be done and it'll be either on a TV station or a streaming channel near you. <laughs> well, that is super exciting. The website from what I saw, the previous project, um, you guys do not want to miss out on seeing what it looks like now that it's being updated. The, the artifacts and, and just all the information that is on there is so cool looking back at history. And the show sounds amazing. I'm looking forward to seeing it. And you guys can all be sure that when it comes out in 2021, we will be talking about it. Um, so with that, once again, thank you so much for your time today, Mr. Sopani. And as always, thank you all for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast YouTube channel and SoundCloud page, both under the Spirit of Success. And follow us on Facebook at spiritof.success9 and Instagram at spiritof.success to get the latest updates about new episodes, announcements, and the ability to participate in the show by asking questions that you would like us to consider to talk about in upcoming episodes. Until next time, I'm your host, Yara, and don't forget to continue challenging yourself and working to make your spirit soar to new heights. Bye. Bye.